Once he told me a story, apparently about an American jazz genius whose name I no longer remember. He said, Ralph, I've watched a film about this master. He was playing tennis there. And he was playing it as if it was the last time. And he said that every time he improvised, he thought that he was doing it for the last time. It was a completely unusual innovation, new and inimitable, because, to my mind, he was the only person who could use the sequences of Mugam in his improvisations. How is it? Vargif brought his own culture to his music. How to say it, it was precisely in his artistic eccentricity that he exceeded even the greatest of his peers. First of all, Vargif is incredibly eccentric. It's very difficult to compare him with anybody else. But in comparison with the masters of American jazz, I would put him beside Mac Tyner. He has the same strong, masterly performance as Vargif. It was fantastic. He was the first jazz man who received the award of honored artist. For jazz, in those years, it was unbelievable. He was the first in the Soviet Union. I don't believe that Vagif was a Soviet jazz musician. Vagif Musafazadeh was an Azerbaijani musical genius. He belonged and should have belonged to the world because of his overwhelming talent. He couldn't talk about music calmly. His eyes immediately shone as if he was a different person from what had been a second earlier. As soon as talk turned to jazz, it was obvious that God had sent him this idea to play jazz for his whole life. Vagif taught us a very strange lesson. We shouldn't be afraid of death. If there was no death in our life, the improvisation of our life would also stop. Life itself is nothing but an improvisation, which finishes with a strange moonlight named death. So this is the photo of Vagif as I knew him. Vagif as I knew him. Vagif
मुझे देख इतनी सारी ऐसे अब बस मार दी अप्रैल मैं अब बस मार It was March or April 1966. I had Bill Evans's new record, Trio 65. I asked Vargif if he knew him. He said, "No. Who is he?" I gave him my address and invited him to listen to his work. And here something incredible happened. Vargif came over to mine. I chose Bill's first composition from the album Trio 65 called Israel. Trio 65. Israel in Nazar Mobility, it's over, we are Israel's. The Ro Mousmina, as this is it. Mousmina, the only day it was no other. But I did that. He was listening and sitting near the piano. When the first part finished, he asked me to stop the record for a second and replay it. As soon as I replayed it, Bill and Vargi started to play simultaneously. I was so surprised that I almost lost my mind. The dates will be the most wonderful. I'm not the dates will be the most. Erti erti da ukra. Shevir kiya. You have to play the music you know on a jam station. You have to know the theme and harmony. And I've never seen Vargif in a difficult situation. Evidently, it was due to his wide erudition, so he was never taken by surprise. His performance was fantastic. We tend to play in this way, but he played in a peculiar way all of his own. And we couldn't touch the instrument after his performance. It was completely wet with sweat. His hands were very tense, and it was strange because though it was almost impossible to play, he performed in a technically independent way. And I remember once he was playing a very good piece that wasn't jazz. It was neither C major nor F major. I asked him, "What key is this, Vargif?" And he said that it was Sol major. I asked, "Does anybody perform jazz in Sol major?" He simply said. Look how comfortable it is. He showed me a few moves, and it was indeed really comfortable. So many years have passed, 40 years, and I've been playing jazz in sol major ever since then, just as he taught me. And I have to say, it's very comfortable. He was very friendly and pleasant. Almost incomparably so. He was a great person with a good sense of humour. He taught me how to say, "I will bite your nose" in Azerbaijani, which means, "If you make me angry, I will bite your nose." It sounds fantastic. We loved him very much. How did you get it? Zalian, Pelvi, Megubari, Kanda. Zal did part of the center. He had a lot of friends. They respected him very much. He was known everywhere, in Moscow, in Donetsk. Whenever we went to a festival, he was already a legendary person. He was facetious, lively, and energetic. He could play and joke, hold a discussion day and night. He was full of energy, and this was felt in his performance too. There was a fantastic energy around him while he was playing. He was an exceptional man. 
We were the same age. He wasn't tall, but plump and with a big moustache. That's why I called him Shah Abbas, a real Azerbaijani man. His fingers were short. When he first started to play, everyone looked on attentively. I knew about him already. The Voice of America often transmitted his performances. I'll tell you one thing. When he was alone, he was an absolutely different person. Vargif was always cheerful, energetic and noisy. He used to encourage all of us to do something, to organize concerts. However, when he was alone, he was immersed in another world. He completely changed. He wanted to express himself more. Whenever he played the piano, he was different. His face totally changed. And you didn't know how he would perform each time. He was an improviser. He knew Azerbaijani national music, Mugam, very well. It was as if his hands didn't belong to him. It was very easy to sing along with him. I grew up with jazz and I know old and modern pianists well. So he was as great a pianist as Ahmad Jamal or Oscar Peterson. I can hardly believe that such an incredible pianist worked with us. I'd argue that he could have been one of the greatest pianists in the world if he hadn't lived in the Soviet Union. I mean, jazz pianists. <laughs> His simplicity gave him a creative impulse. The astonishingly tender keys of his music came from his kindness and other characteristics. It came out when he was performing both Mugam and jazz. He won an eternal place both in people's hearts and in the history of jazz. Hello. No, ma'am. No, what? I have a few souvenirs here. Vargif's records. He's playing the organ here. This was very unique for those days. And this is a plate, but definitely not one for a meal. It was presented as a souvenir to all the participants of the commemorative concert in Baku in 1983. Vakif Mustafa Zadeh was a brilliant and well-known person. I remember him participating in two festivals. Unfortunately, I don't remember the events of the Tallinn Festival in 1966, as I was very young in those days. And I can't remember all of the participants, but I can clearly picture his performance during the Tallinn Festival of 1967, which was very emotional and greeted with cheers. <laughs> We were staying near the Tallinn Hotel, and then the most interesting thing happened. There was a table reserved in the in-tourist restaurant. Vargif, Tartuz, some of our friends and I were sitting there, 
when suddenly a man with the surname Schultz ran into the restaurant and said, congratulations, my friends, Willis Conover is in the hall. I was about to faint. I'd been listening to his music since 1956, and 11 years later, there he was, standing in the hall. Over there is Willis Conover's table. And over here, there is our table where we camped out for the whole six days. Willis was carrying a square leather briefcase and it was very funny. We thought that he had some device in there. We were saying to each other, there must be a powerful machine in there. <laughs> when the festival was over, Vargif really amazed him. When Vargif performed in trio, Willis was fascinated. He was shouting, bravo, bravo. I remember him sitting at the back. He suddenly opened his briefcase and presented a vinyl to Vargif. It turned out that these were his records, and he gave Vargi for vinyl with his signature. It was very amusing. When Willis called me from his studio and said to me, Maria, come over to the studio, I want you to hear something. And we sat there and we listened, and Willis was so impressed, and he said, do you know who that is? And I said, no. And um, he said, that's Vagif Mustafazadeh. And I heard him at the Tallinn Jazz Festival. And he is absolutely incredible. I was so impressed at Tallinn. And I would want to hear even more about him uh, in the future. Time for jazz. Willis Conover in Washington, D.C., with the voice of America. Later, when Willis Conover was given Vargif's records, he told everyone that he'd seen him in Tallinn at the festival. These ones were recorded with Tartus. He gave their records out many times. Willis played them over and over. Natural genius. He yeah. probably he didn't speculate. He just yeah, yeah, yeah. played the way, and everybody, even even the 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 greatest musicians, what's going on? You know, what is he doing? You know, yeah. wait a minute. You know, a new uh -huh. sound. but uh, what did he play? This is no. This is has a different no. There is no structure. He's simply he's here. He's there, and uh, then he comes back. Uh, you have to. Study this music to find out, but maybe it's not necessarily for people born outside to study. Leave it to the people who know this and let them play. Like it is so difficult for to play Latin jazz. 
for being people not born in Cuba. They will never be as good in Cuban music as the people who were born in Cuba. The same thing happened uh, with uh, uh, Vagif. The same thing was uh, with uh, Paco de Lucia, who played flamenco music, the, the music of, of Spanish gypsies. So that was making him very, very unique. But this is an example. To be as successful, you don't have to play the same music. Play your music. Somebody in a different part of the world will play something else. But people want every time. They are only interested in what is unique, what is fresh. He could charm a person with his music. This capacity belongs to Mugam as well. This endless loop and variations. And you want to follow all these variations, although it becomes useless because they replace each other consistently, as in an unbroken chain. All of these aspects were formed in a rhythmical system of jazz that he performed. He never changed the rhythm. That's why this fusion of jazz rhythm with his discoveries of sequences of Mugam created such an interesting combination. This person thoroughly studied and soaked up the oeuvres of Bill Evans and other musicians and thinkers. Moreover, he combined all these things into a distinctive national style. He aimed to give his music a recognizable image. I think this is the highest achievement of a creative work. Merely to perform like someone else, that can be good too. But if the music has utterly distinctive aspects, such as a national style and rhythm, to my mind, Vargiv's greatness is revealed above all in the music which he created. We can confidently call it Azerbaijani jazz. Unfortunately, no such experience has been developed in Russia. All of us would love Russian jazz music to be known and recognized from the first notes, but we just can't say that's the case. Yeah, muidugi Vagif Mustafa Sadeh oli isale kindlasti üks suur üllatus, sest tema Vagif Mustafa Zadeh's oeuvre was a pleasant shock for my father. His use of national music, such as Mugam, and his own experience, which was associated with the use of the India Raga tradition, were unique. My father valued the musical style that he created very highly. And that's why he was absolutely different from existing jazz bands, pianists, including members of the American Blues School. It was a music of freedom, 
and freedom means he could express himself as he wished. Nobody told him to do it. Maybe it was against Azerbaijan traditional rules because he was doing something sacrilegious. He was breaking down the rules. It was against the rules of uh, jazz music because the structure of his music was different. So it was very unique. And, f uh, and I thought to myself, well, this is so fresh, so it's exciting. You, there were so many great musicians in the Soviet Union, but they are only copies of American jazz. And being a copy will never be, a copy is never as strong as the original. Who cares about a copy? But still, you have to be really great in jazz. You have to create your own music, your own language. And Vagif created his own language of expression. I never seen this one. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a wonderful photo. It's amazing. That's Vagif and me. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. That's Tbilisi, 1978. <laughs> Well, 78 was the outbreak of our big jazz festivals. We started this festival with huge enthusiasm. In 1978, we held the first all-union jazz festival. There were, as far as I remember, 27 participants from all the republics, including Azerbaijan. But Vagif was ours, from Tbilisi. Everyone said that he was ours. After the concert, I came to him and I asked if I, if, you, if I can interview. And of course, he agreed and we, uh, uh, he asked me to come to his hotel room. And this, there is another surprise, <clears throat> because I go into this hotel and Vagif is lying in bed in his pajamas and he is lying like this with his uh, uh, sheets and like this and probably he was ill, he had a heart attack, a heart problem. So he was very weak and his mother was sitting next to him. And he was such a gentle and I was sitting next to him and he was yeah, explaining me about Mogam that there are um, his structures like a 32 bars and each one is in the different meter and scales and he was so kind to me, and as I was sitting there maybe half an hour, did this interview, and I said, okay, Vagif, you know, we would like to invite you to Poland to have a great festival called Zezembury. Can you come? And he said, his eyes were, of course I would like to come and play. Thank you so much. But he says, but please send this invitation to me directly, I will give you my address, because if you send to Moscow, to Goskonsis, they will never send it to me. Please send it to me. Next year, we had a great news about Vagif winning a competition in Monaco. He came to Tbilisi very gladly. It was his tour with his band. He said that he had to go to Tashkent. We answered, why do you need it? New Year is coming soon. Why don't you just visit your homeland, have a rest? He refused and said that he had a Philharmonic concert, which he couldn't miss. Two or three days later, I had a concert and I was rehearsing. I saw Tamaz entering. He called me backstage. I asked what happened, and he said that Vargif had passed away. I don't know exactly how, how he heard of it uh, or who told him. Um, we discussed it because he was very distraught. His first reaction was immediately to do a series of commemorative programs. He was very um, melancholy when doing the program, and he had to 
try to shake that feeling of sadness because a feeling of sadness is reflected in in your voice. You, there's no way that you can that you can hide it. Vadim Yulchenkov called me and said, "You know, last night uh, Vagif Mustafa died." I said, "That's not possible. You know, he was only 39. It was, it was a shocking news." And I wrote a telegram or something to Elsa in Tbilisi, saying uh, how big losses. When you have a talent that you cannot realize fully, this is certainly a tragedy. And it is a fact that he died on stage. That is the whole tragedy of the situation. It was a result of the explosion of his unrealized talent. Just listen to how he performs his composition impromptu. To me, this is an atom, this is an explosion. This is one human emotion, one human breath, followed by death. This is life and death in the same bottle. He who had the chance to, to become a real, a powerful figure of international jazz. Maybe not a, an international star because that depends on many other factors. He would, to be a star, you have to have a, a freedom of movement. He would have, like Aziza, many years later, to move to the West. You don't make a career sitting living in Baku or Tbilisi and waiting for the passport and contacting a uh, ghost concert to let you know, to arrange your visa and passport and travel, uh, you know, and to have to, to be surrounded by KGB people watching if you move here, move there. This is too restrictive. In his lifetime, Vagif was unable to express everything he kept in his heart, his full talent and potential, his innermost thoughts. However, he broke this wall with his own hands, with his own talent. He really achieved this, there's no question at all. I like to describe um, Vagif as a meteor as a comet uh, streaking against the sky you only see them for a very short time but for the time that you see them and you see the brilliance and you feel what they have done i think that this is the best way that i can explain um, the talent the genius the incredible compositional talent of vagif mustafa zadeh i wish he had lived 20 30 40 years more, but for what we had, it was marvelous. I'm very pleased that it's been my fate to be a musician. 
First of all, I would like to say that I'm pleased because I've always loved music very much and I've always loved working. What have I achieved in music? I've discovered myself, my own personality. Aziza, has your father taught you to play jazz on the piano? No, he wanted me to learn it by myself. He wanted you to achieve it on your own? Yes. Apparently you used to listen to him, didn't you? Of course I did. He sometimes let me. One of the problems for musicians like him was that it was new. So people were not certain, you know, is it really jazz or is it some other, already some other music? He was a genius and his music today is as stunning, as brilliant as it was then. There's nothing old behind this, it's still fresh. Vagif was a real jazz pianist. He was a musical master. This was jazz at the professional level. He had very swift jazz hands. If you write the word jazz man in capital letters next to his name, you've said everything that needs to be said.